Well, I want you to go ahead and turn your Bibles this morning to uh, the book of Judges, Judges chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. Uh, on Sunday mornings, uh, I've been teaching the uh, adult Sunday school class, and so uh, on Sunday mornings, we've been going through the book of Judges, and so as we've been going through the book of Judges, uh, this was what I was supposed to teach on last week, but as I was studying it week before last, getting ready for last week, I knew I wasn't going to be teaching on that, because that's going to be a great Father's Day message, amen, and so God just burned that in my heart and said that's what you need to be preaching on uh, for our Father's Day. And so as we take a look at this text of Scripture, so there's so many great passages within the Word of God that we can uh, begin to think about Father's Day. But here we find in Judges chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 10, we find here in the Word of God uh, that the Bible says, All of the generations also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Now, this is probably one of the saddest passages of Scripture that we find in the Word of God. Now, what's interesting, I find myself doing this every year, and I try not to do this every year, but I can't help myself for doing this every year. Usually on Mother's Day, you know, you finally, you, you've got that nice rosy uh, message, that nice fluffy message for our mothers, right? And then uh, come Father's Day, you get kind of hardcore on the fathers, amen? I, so I'm sorry about that, but that's just what, you know, it, it, that's the way it comes comes along sometimes, and sometimes, uh, you know, that's the way men need to get things sometimes, <laughs> amen, so uh, you get towards the women with, uh, you know, those roses and, uh, you know, a little, little bit of flowers and things like that, but sometimes the men, we just need that sledgehammer, amen, we, we need to just kind of lay it down sometimes, so as we look here at the Word of God, probably one of the saddest passages of Scripture here within the Word of God, the nation of Israel, they had come in, they had come in and they had conquered the land, God told them that he was going to go and drive out all of the inhabitants before them. And so as they come in, they come in and they conquer the land. They drive out the inhabitants of the land, or at least most of them. We'll get more into that in just a minute. And as they drive them out, they settle the land. It's the land that God gave to them. God gave them that land. And it was a precious land. It was a blessed land. It's a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And so as God gives them this land, they now in the land. And they have possession of the land. They divide up the land by tribe. And so now you have the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel that now consist as the land of Israel as God gave them. Again, God gave them that land. In fact, God told Joshua in Joshua chapter 1, he said that you're going to go in, you're going to take possession of the land, which I swore to their forefathers to give to them. Amen. So they could have gotten it 40 years prior to Joshua's time, but yet they didn't have the faith to go in and conquer the land. But now they're in the land. They have settled the land. They have divided the land. They're living in the land. And this is probably the third or the fourth generation, at least the third generation of them now being settled within the land. In that short of a time frame, the Bible says that here was a generation that did not know the Lord. How sad is that? Uh, that God had done all of these phenomenal things for them, that God had delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians, that God not only delivered them out of the hands of the Egyptians, He was faithful to them even in their time of disobedience. That when they went around for those 40 years and they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, God gave them everything that they needed from their food to their water to the you know, fire in the, in the cloud, and God gave everything to them. God God guided them. God protected them. God intervened for them. And even when they went into the land, you know, God, they, they didn't fight that fight upon their own. God went out before them. And God has made that very clear to them that he went out before them. They went out, for instance, to Jericho, the very first place that they go to. And what do they do? They march around the walls and they fall down. Amen? So they didn't do that. God did that. God delivered the other nations into their hand and now in Joshua's day they were faithful to God and the elders behind Joshua they were faithful to God but now all of a sudden where it's the third whether it's the third or the fourth generation here it is is a generation that does not know God how sad is that 
How depressing is it to be in the land of Israel, to be God's chosen people, to be God's chosen race, to be God's own nation? And no doubt, you know, as we begin to think about here is a generation that does not know God. As we think about that, how can they be Israelites and not know God? It doesn't mean that they don't know about God. It doesn't mean that they haven't heard the story. It doesn't mean that they don't know about the ten plagues. It doesn't know that that doesn't mean that they don't know about the parting of the Red Sea. It doesn't mean that they don't know what God did on the mountain as God gave them the commandments. It doesn't mean that they don't know about Moses and they don't know about Joshua and they don't know about the hand of God that going in and even the stories of Jericho. No doubt they know about all of those things. There are stories that they have heard in the back of their mind. There are probably stories that they've heard all of their life of those stories have been passed on from generation to generation and they've heard those things but they don't mean a thing to them because they only know the stories but they don't know the Lord. You know, that's a major difference between knowing the things about God and knowing God. Here is a generation, they're Israelites, they're Hebrews, they're living in a land that God had given to them and so no doubt they knew about God but they didn't know God. And so it's abundantly clear that they didn't know God. It's abundantly clear that they didn't have any heart for God or any passion for God or any desire for God because they were chasing after all of the other gods of the land. In fact, when we look at this text of Scripture, when we look here in the context of all of this, we find that after they had come into the land, after they had conquered the land, and after they had settled the land, Joshua was still alive. And the Bible says that the Lord came to Joshua. And as the Lord comes to Joshua, the Lord says, you weren't obedient to me, right? You weren't obedient to the words that I said. You you, you still have Canaanites living in the land. You still have Hittites living in the land. What's worse than that? as I told you also to tear tear down the altars to those false gods and you didn't do that you didn't tear down their altars and so they still have altars of Baal they still have altars to other false gods within the land and so in verse 3 the Lord says to them therefore I say also uh, that, that I will not drive them out before you because they will become thorns in your side and their gods will be a snare to you And so here it is that they learn, you know what, God blessed them, God drove out the the inhabitants of the land, but they didn't continue to do it, they kind of got lazy, they got complacent, and after they got lazy and they got complacent, they just stopped driving them out and they stopped tearing down those altars to those false gods and say, we're here. Right, we've showed up, we're on scene, let's just go ahead and divide up the land. And you know, we've, we've done exactly what God told us to do, and God said, no you didn't. You didn't do exactly like I told you to do. And there's going to be a consequence to those. There's going to be great consequences to those uh, those things. And they're going to be a snare to you. They're going to be thorns to you. And as we read the rest of the book of Judges, and not just the rest of the book of Judges, the rest of the history of Israel, all the way through, all the way up to the coming of Jesus himself, all the way up to the destruction of Israel in A.D. 70, we find that that was a continual theme that those false gods, in those lands were still a thorn to them. They're still a thorn to them today, to this very day. Amen? So as we think about that and begin to understand it was all because of obedience, but who's God talking to? God is talking to Joshua. The Lord is talking to Joshua. The Lord is talking to the elders underneath Joshua. Apparently they were all assembled together. And in verse 4 it tells us, And when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to the sons of Israel, probably Joshua and the elders, when the Lord spoke these things to the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voice and they wept they wept they heard from God and the word from God here it was he said I've been with you all the way from Gilgal he said I've been with you from Gilgal to uh, to 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 Boakim I've been with you every single step of the way from the beginning of this journey to the ending of this journey I have been faithful to you every single step of the way but you've failed to do your part and when they heard that their hearts were broken and they wept why Uh, 
because although they weren't completely obedient to God, they knew God. And when they recognized the fact that they had disobeyed God, it broke their heart and they wept. God, I have failed you. God, I have forsaken you. God, I have turned my back upon you. God, I have not been completely obedient to you. And because they knew God, it broke their heart and they wept. But here's a generation that does not know God, and the Bible says that they're chasing after other gods. They're chasing after other gods. They're following those other gods. And God tells them that what they're doing is wrong. And you know, like, they're, they're like, well, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't break my heart. I'm not going to lose any sleep over that. I don't care. I don't care that what I'm doing is displeasing to you. I don't care that what I'm doing is dishonoring to you. I don't care that what I am doing is an abomination to you and it goes directly in contradiction to what your word has to say. It doesn't bother me in any way, shape, or form. Why? Because that is a generation that does not know God. See, when we look at those who do know God, doesn't mean they're perfect people. I'm not a perfect person, amen. And even though Brother Keith was wrong one time in his life, and he might have been mistaken about that, he's not a perfect person, amen. And none of us are perfect people. We all make mistakes. We all have failures within our life. But as a child of God, when you're confronted with that, especially with the Lord himself dealing with your heart, it should break you and it should cause you to come into repentance. So now we have to ask ourselves a question, where do we come, where, where do we get from Joshua's generation and the elders behind him generation that, and that was there, that was faithful to God, where did we come to that? Where, where, where did they get to a point to where there was a generation who no longer knew God? How did they get to that point within their lives? The Bible says here in verse 6 in Joshua chapter 2, it says, When Joshua had dismissed the people of the sons of Israel, each went to his inheritance to possess the land. Now, what we need to understand is the end of the book of Joshua kind of overlapped the beginning of the book of, uh, of Judges, and so you find that overlapping there. And at the end of the book of Joshua, you find that assembly, it records that assembly there and then Joshua says very boldly Joshua says very plainly as these elders of these nations are about to of these individual tribes are about to go back to their own possessed land the land that was given to them their their own territory right before they go back Joshua says as far as me and my house he, he tells them first of all if you want to continue to serve the God of the Egyptians the God you know those false gods those pagans pagan gods you do what you want to do but as far as me and my house we're going to serve the Lord amen we're going to serve God now you do what you feel is right and really that's the whole theme of the book of Judges as you look in the book of Judges really there's two themes to them that they continue to do what's right in their own sight it's funny we want to use some of the judges as an example right oh I want to be like Samson do you really <laughs> he was a wicked man. But you find the greater theme of the book of Judges, and that's God's grace and that's God's mercy, despite us, despite them. Amen? They did what was right in their own sight. So Joshua says, you want to go serve those other gods, you go right ahead. But I've heard from God myself. I know God. I know the hand of God. I've walked with God. I have seen how faithful He has been to me every single step of the way. I know the abundant blessings of God. More important than that, even if He's never done a thing for me, I know Him and He's worthy of serving because I know Him. And now all of a sudden there was a generation that did not know the Lord. So as we think about that generation that did not know the Lord, again, how did they get from point A of a generation like Joshua who knew the Lord from point B to a generation that we're looking at today that did not know the Lord? The Bible goes on in verse 7 and says, The people served the Lord all of the days of Joshua and all of the days of the elders who served 
Joshua, who had seen the great work of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now, as we look at this, you know, we begin to think about this. We look on down in chapter, uh, chapter 3, in verse 9, exactly how many generations had passed on. You look at chapter, nine, uh, chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, When the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer of the sons of Israel to deliver them, Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. So you find Caleb's younger brother, right? He is, Caleb is Joshua's generation. The younger brother would be of the elder's generation. And now Othniel would be of that third generation. So we ask ourselves a question, well, how in three generations did they get from Joshua to we don't know the Lord? How did they get there? Well, first of all, the Bible says that they were assembled, right? In verse 6, it says, when Joshua had dismissed the people. So what, what, what was the purpose of their gathering? Their purpose of their gathering was Joshua stating very boldly and very, uh, very clearly, hey, this is what God has done for us. This is how God has blessed us. This is how God has been with us every single step of the way. And not only that, thus saith the Lord God, he said we weren't completely obedient to them, therefore they were wept before the Lord. They had a sacrifice. Obviously, they repented. They cried out. They asked God for forgiveness of their sins. And now they were dismissed. And the Bible says they continued to serve God all of Joshua's day. And not only all of Joshua's day, but the elders who were underneath Joshua, that next generation. So Joshua's the older generation. The elders are the generation underneath Joshua. And it was the next generation who did not know the Lord. So Joshua's generation served the Lord. The elders' generation served the Lord. Now all of a sudden we've got this generation that is no longer serving the Lord. And we ask again, how in the world did this take place? Well, obviously Joshua was teaching them what the Lord has done. And Joshua was teaching them what the Lord had said. And Joshua was very boldly making a proclamation in front of them as far as me and my house we're going to serve the Lord but the question that we have to ask is what, the, is what the teaching of the Lord did still going on within the household and was the teaching of the word of God still going on within the household and was the father of each one of the houses much less the, the leader of the tribe but the father of each one of the household were they making bold resolution as for me and my house we're going to serve the Lord we're going to be obedient to God I don't care what you do I don't care how you live. Now, really, I do. I want you to live right, right? I want you to serve the Lord. And so did Joshua. I want everybody to serve God. But I can't make you serve God. But as far as me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. And I'm going to make that bold resolution that I, as the father of the house, as the head of the household, I am going to serve the Lord. And as long as you're under my roof, you're going to serve the Lord too. Amen? You get that out there on your own, you start paying your own bills, doing your own thing, hey, I want you to serve the Lord, but you're no longer under the authority of my, my house, of my home. But as long as you are, you're going to serve the Lord too. And you know what? I'm going to teach you all the things that God has done. Fathers, does your child know about how you got saved? Has your children ever heard your testimony? And I hear people say all the time, well, I don't have much of a testimony. I was raised in church all my life. And then one day God spoke to my heart, let me know that I was a sinner. I walked down the aisle. I asked Jesus to save me from a sin. I had as much of a testimony. Because you exited eternal death and you entered into eternal life. And that is much of a testimony. 
Maybe you weren't out there being wild, living in the world, doing everything everybody else is doing, but friends, I want you to understand every testimony is a powerful testimony, and your children need to hear your testimony. Amen? They need to know what God has done in your life because sometimes, you know what we teach our children? You've got to go to church. You've got to go to church. And that's all they ever hear their whole life. You've got to go to church. Now, don't get me wrong. Going to church is important. Amen? But when children hear all their life that all they're required to do and all that is expected out of them is just going to church and you just got to go to church, there's no rhyme or reason. That's just what we do, right? We go to church every Sunday, every Wednesday. Vacation Bible school's coming up next week. We've got to go to church and that's what we do, right? That's what is expected. No, there's much more than that. Yes, they need to go to church, but why do we go to church? We go to church to serve the Lord because He's worthy this is what God has done in my life and he's made a transformation within my life a few weeks ago talked about how mothers need to teach their children and and, and the fact is you know as a quote statistic uh, then that that mothers even work when both of them are working within the home they are uh, mothers traditionally spend more time with the children than fathers do and that's, that's just the fact, and I believe that's the way God designed things. Amen? They gave them that motherly heart. But fathers, you, you don't have an out. Amen? You don't have an out. In fact, the Bible makes it extraordinarily clear that fathers are responsible for teaching children, and we need to teach our children. Now, we need to teach them. There's nothing wrong with teaching a child how to throw a ball. You need to teach a child how to throw a ball. Amen? There's nothing wrong with teaching a child how to turn a wrench. It's great if you teach the child how to turn a, ran- uh, turn a wrench or how to swing a hammer or whatever you teach that child how to do. Amen? But what we need to be teaching them first and foremost, we need to be teaching them who God is, and we need to be teaching them the Word of God. We need to instill within them in every single area, every single aspect of our life, this is who God is. This is what God's all about. It's not just about we need to go to church, but He is a God that is almighty and all-powerful, and He loves you. How much does He love you? He loved you enough to send His very own Son down to the cross to die for you. That's how much He loves you. And this is what His Word has to say say so yes teach them how to change a tire teach them how to turn a wrench teach them how to throw a ball do all those wonderful things with their with your children but what is the most important teach them about jesus teach them the wonderful truths about jesus don't just pass it off as a will let the wife do that i'm not much of a teacher yes you are because god has instilled that within you And you need to live it. Amen? You need to live it. And you need to speak it. You need to speak it out. And plant those words, not in the ears of your children, but in the heart of your children. For a seed would be implanted. So here we look back at Joshua chapter 2, and in Joshua chapter 2, we find that Again, in verse 7, the people served the Lord all of the days of Joshua and all of the days of the elders who served Joshua, who had seen all of the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. They saw it. They knew who he was. So today we don't see those things, but friends, I want you to understand today we've got something far greater Far, far greater. In the Old Testament, God dealt with people in a physical way. Today, God's dealing with people in spirit and in truth, in spirit and in truth. The truth is the Word of God, and so we instill the Word of God within people. But fathers, if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit of God within you. And if you have the Holy Spirit of God within you, your children ought to be seeing the work of the Spirit of God within your life. No, you may not be perfect in every way, and yes, you may fail, and you need to own up to that by the way if you do fail but friends I want you to understand your child is looking at you and observing your life more than anybody else is 
Amen? You leave church, pastor just preached on love, you get in the car and you and your wife is going for the juggler, and guess what? You're not living it. Amen? Amen. Or maybe you went for the juggler and then you have to say, I'm sorry, man. I messed up. Maybe that happened before church. Then you got church, all of a sudden smiles are on the faces and you get back in the car. I'm sorry. I messed up. Amen? And your children need to see that in you. It's important. It's very important. But I believe they forgot to pass it on. I didn't forget, they just didn't do it. Didn't pass the Lord along. Didn't teach, didn't show, didn't demonstrate. Verse 9 says, And they buried him in the territory of his inheritance. So they buried Joshua. Joshua died. All the elders underneath him died. Verse 10 says, All of the generation also were gathered together to their fathers. Now what does that mean? All of the generations were gathered together to their fathers. I mean, they all died. Amen? They all died. Just like Joshua, they're all in the tomb now. They're all dead. Now who's here to lead? What example does are they going to follow? Oh, I promise you, they're going to have examples. They're going to have people that are going to rise up before them and say, hey, come follow me. And it may not be a godly example. It may not be an example that leads them to things that are going to bless them. They ended up as slaves at the end. Maybe examples that lead them into slavery. That traps them and snares them. Maybe even destroys them. I have no doubt whatsoever we are living in a generation that does not know the Lord. Doesn't mean we don't have Christians. Obviously we do. We've dropped the ball, haven't we? We need to raise our children up in the knowledge and admonition and love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just let's go to church because it's time to go to church. But we're going to church because we have the great privilege and the great honor of serving Jesus and all He's worthy. He is so worthy. Well, let's go. You, you got them pumped up. You got them excited. They're ready. Hey, well, maybe my children are grown now. It's not too late. You still have their attention. Maybe you don't think you do, but you do. Amen. You certainly have your grandchildren's attention. While we were singing, Elena just walked up to me just then, grabbed me by the pant leg and said, Pop, Pop, we just went in the back room and learned how to be adults. (laughs) I still don't have a clue what that means, but she wanted me to know. Amen. I have to talk to her a little more about that after the service. What in the world were you talking about? Amen? So, you have their attention. It's not too late. Live it out. As we're here in a generation that does not know the Lord, let's teach them about the Lord. Man, it needs to start with us. I can take you right up the road to New Orleans, Louisiana, the Franklin Avenue Baptist Church. Freddie Luter became the church of a, de- a pastor of a dead church 
1986. It was dead. They were shutting it down. First Baptist Church of New Orleans asked him to come in to be their pastor. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to target the men. And that's what he did. They're today the largest church in the state of Louisiana. They just built a massive building in New Orleans East. As you, as you drive in, you can't miss it. God did a phenomenal work. He targeted men. Those men raised up to the occasion to be men. To be men of God. God still blessed them today in a phenomenal way. Men, we need to step up to the, step up to the plate. And I praise God. We've, we've, we've got an abundance of men here that are stepping up to the plate. And I praise God for each one of you. It takes all of us. Amen. At home, it starts at home. Continues at work or wherever you're at. Continues at the church. We need to teach this generation. I was listening to American Family Radio just the other day as our praise team makes their way up this, uh, this way. And they were talking about something. They were talking about Jeopardy. Now, I don't have cable, so I don't watch Jeopardy. I don't, I don't watch anything, really. They were talking about a, a recent, I guess it was recent episode of Jeopardy. And you, you all are familiar enough with Jeopardy. You kind of know how it works supposed to answer the question. And so it was Bible trivia, and this Bible trivia, it says, Our Father who art, and fill in the blank, Our Father who art in heaven, blank be thy, thy name. Nobody got it! Our Father who art in heaven, blank be thy name. I mean, you'd think at least one of them would be Catholic or something that's heard that a thousand times, right? But none of them, nobody got it. Not a single one. These aren't dummies that are up here. These are highly educated. They're on that show because they're smart people. And not a single one of them got it. And guess what? Hallowed be thy name. It doesn't matter what translation you use. It's in there as hallowed be thy name. Amen. Kind of equivalent to asking how many commandments are there today or in the Bible. How many commandments? Well, we don't want to ask how many are there today. It's no telling what we would hear. People are absolutely ignorant of God's Word today because we're living in a generation that does not know the Word. Fathers, you are responsible for your children, and it doesn't matter how old they are. You are responsible for your children. Church, we are responsible for our children. Not just in this church, but we are a lighthouse in this community. We are responsible for these children. And we need to be training them. We need to be teaching them. We need to be investing them. But especially in your own home. How dare we allow the next generation to be that generation that does not know the Lord. Right now, as the praise team's up here, let's everybody stand. Maybe you're here today and you're a father. Maybe your child's not saved. Maybe your child doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I believe there's power in prayer, especially when God's church comes together and prays together. Amen. Would you today pray for your child? You can come down to this altar and pray. You can pray right there where you're at. You could turn to somebody next to you and say, Hey, the Bible says we're two or more agree upon anything, it'll be done. Would you pray for me? Come down here. I'll be more than happy to pray with you. Pray. Maybe you don't know how to teach your child. Maybe you don't know where to start. The Bible says if anybody lacks the wisdom, let them ask, and the Lord's going to give it to them. Ask. God will show you. I'll be glad to talk with you. I'll be glad to counsel with you. Pray for them. Pray for boldness and wisdom on your part. Do that right now. Anything else on your heart or mind this morning, you come as God so leads. You know, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the first thing that you need to do is come to know Jesus. Are you saved today? If not, 
give your life to Jesus so that you will have that testimony to share, but more importantly, that you're going to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you'll be heaven bound. Would you do that today right now as the praise team leads? As God so directs, you come as God leads you.